Your fence, the peasant, taste a bite, he's greater than the Lord man, and with a beggar shares a mite. Oh, he can afford that. Thank you very much. It is a tremendous honour to be asked to speak in the memory of one of Scotland's greatest champions for democracy. But let me apologise at the beginning. I'm not a historian, I say that because I can see there are a few in, and uh, it is not my purpose tonight to give a historical appreciation of the life and times of Thomas Muir. There are many others better able to do that than I, and my ability is not up to that task. What I'd like to do is to try and draw the continuity of objective between Thomas Muir and the political reformers of the late 18th century, and the contemporary campaign we have in modern Scotland for political reform. And I also want to look at some of the challenges we have to the campaign here and now and what we need to do about it. And you will guess from Jamie's introduction and my background that um, I am on one side of the argument in Scottish politics. Uh, so I apologize in advance if there are people here from the other side. But I do very much welcome you because we need to conduct these discussions in open for no other reason than that some of you will need to change your minds if we are to win our arguments. Now, the, this book that's been mentioned by Murray, this, uh, for those that do want the historical appreciation, I recommend it highly. I read it in preparation for, for this lecture, and I'm not going to give a, a detailed history, but I just want to recap on the story, because to me, what I'm left wondering is why Hollywood haven't yet made the feature film of this, because it is a story of considerable legend by a man who faced more adversity and adventure in his relatively short lifetime than most of us could contemplate. So um, he graduates to the Scottish Bar at the tender age of 22. Him and Skirving form this organization, uh, the Friends of the People. Uh, and Muir is such, such are his abilities and his, his intellect and his oratory that within a few short months, he is essentially one of the leaders of this national movement for political reform. That year, he goes to revolutionary France and he connects with exiles who believe of similar uh, persuasion and, and, are, and are leading similar movements, the likes of Tom Paine from England and Wolf Tone from Ireland. And he connects with them and begins to put these movements and these uprisings that they're planning in an international and European perspective. Whilst he's in France, of course, he's declared an outlaw by the Edinburgh High Court on these trumped up charges of sedition that are brought before him. Now, Muir could have easily got asylum and stayed in France at that time, but he chose to come back to Edinburgh to contest those charges and to face his accusers. He lost because it was rigged against him from the very beginning, and the head of the Scottish judiciary, Lord Braxfield himself, a very staunch champion of the status quo and determined to kill the reform movement, made an example of Muir by sentencing him to 14 years deportation to the colonies. Now, that was a sentence that at the time provoked outrage, and Muir languished in a prison ship on the Thames in a, a, a barge called a, a hulk, whilst the press and parliament debated that sentence. But the sentence was duly executed, and for most of 1794, he was aboard a convict ship, sailing initially to Rio de Janeiro, then back across the Atlantic, under the Cape, and on to Australia. When he was in Australia, he was continually making plans for his escape. And by early 1996, he persuaded the French captain of an American ship to give him safe passage across the Pacific, arriving in Vancouver Island and then slowly making their way down the eastern seaboard of what is today the United States. When they reached the Bay of California, in order to avoid capture by the British, Muir hands himself over to a Spanish sea captain hoping to get safe passage to Spain. But the Spanish authorities decide to detain and arrest Muir, and he's sent uh, in a prison ship back to Spain, by this time having fully circumnavigated the globe. As they arrive in Cadiz, they find that the port is blocked by British ships, and a gun battle ensues, during which Muir loses an eye and half of his face, something that leaves him a permanent disfigurement and constant pain. He's nursed back to some sort of fitness, uh, in, in, in Spain, whilst the Spanish and French authorities argue about what should happen to him, the French petitioning for his release. Eventually, after four months, he's allowed to go to France, and he enters Paris and is treated in late 
1797 is a hero of the revolution. And Muir spends most of the next year, pretty much his last year of life, in Paris reconnecting with those exiles and planning not only the uprisings in Britain, but planning also the support from the French government for those uprisings. So that was Thomas Muir. He died in January 1999, unable to see what would become of the efforts that he made. And of course, the Scotland in which Muir was operating in was very different from the Scotland in which we're operating in today. For one thing, there were a lot fewer people. The population was 1.6 million. The population of England at that time, just 5 million people. Also, um, it was very much a separate country still, Scotland. Muir was born less than 20 years after Culloden. The Union was still very much in its infancy. Several centuries of shared experience and integration were yet to follow by the time Muir was active. But most of all, it was not a democratic country in any way, shape, or form. 1.6 million people in Scotland, but only 2,665 people were able to vote to determine the 45 Scottish representatives in the Palace of Westminster. And they were the landed gentry. They were the aristocracy who kept power very much for themselves, and they put placemen in there to guarantee that their power would be retained. So, in that context, the idea of every man, and it was man, and with apologies to the women in the audience, but that was their objective at the time, but the idea even of every man being able to exercise a vote in determining political representation was truly revolutionary. And because the ruling class at that time was so frightened, and because they had seen what had happened just across the channel in France, they were determined to crush these reformers they were determined to make sure that this tradition was died out. So they used every ounce of their power, both political and military, to crush Muir and his followers. And the reform movement of the 1790s, it died away. But it planted seeds which then grew in the 19th century, and which meant that step by step we began to get incremental democratic reforms until we reached the situation today where every man and woman over the age of 18 is allowed to vote in elections. So I wonder, of course, what Muir would make if he came back and see, was able to see how, what we had done in the years uh, since his death. What would he think of, of where we'd got to now? Well, I think the first thing he would remark upon was the fact that they were arguing for everybody to be able to elect the parliament. And we still have a situation in the United Kingdom where the majority of our members of parliament are not elected by anyone. The House of Lords must truly be an affront to any Democrat or anyone who believes in democracy. And yet, almost without limit, privilege and power is pushing its membership up. It ought to be abolished and it ought to be replaced by an elected second chamber drawn from the, national, uh, the nations and the regions of the United Kingdom for as long as that multinational state continues to exist. I think Muir would also be extremely concerned to see that at the last election, 14 million people in the United Kingdom did not exercise their right to vote, the right for which Thomas Muir had fought and died. And we need to ask ourselves, if we believe in defending and extending democracy, why that is, and we need to urgently do something about it. Is it because people are just apathetic and are disinterested in the outcome of the election? Or is it because they feel alienated from that system and they feel impotent to change it and feel their vote will not have any effect? I think it's possibly a bit of both, but we ought to be concerned principally about the latter. And there are a number of practical steps that we should be arguing for to try and improve the situation. To start with, we shouldn't have to register to vote. It shouldn't be something that you have to claim like a benefit. We should, by virtue of being a citizen of the country, be entitled to vote. And there should be automatic voter enrollment for everyone so that the next time you apply for a driving license or a passport or even the next time you pay tax, the computer will check whether or not you're in the electoral register. And if you're not and you're entitled to be so, it will put you there. So you don't need to go through the process every year of registering. The state has the technology and the capability now to do auto-enrollment and we should insist upon it. I think also 
We ought to look at the education of politics in our schools. How do we teach people about political participation? To stop it being a dry, arid theoretical process and to try and encourage people to understand that it is about being part of their humanity. It is about how we organize society. And I have a situation where when people reach the age of majority, whether it be 16 in Scotland or 18 for a UK election, that they are basically gagging to go and get the vote, wanting to demand it and anxious to do that as a way of coming of age. We could also look at changing the date of elections. I, I don't know why we have them on a Thursday in a working day when most people have the inconvenience of trying to juggle it. Why and why do we have to have it over one day? And why can you not vote online? Why can we not simply have a unique code that we go online and we fill in, we get the ballot paper, we click and it's done? Make it simple. Why do we have to make it so difficult and mysterious? So maybe if we argue for some of those things, we might be able to change the levels of political participation. I think Thomas Muir, and Jamie said he wasn't a Republican, but he certainly was before he died. Um, I think he would also marvel at the fact that we still have a monarchy in this country. And that in this country, the United Kingdom, I mean, of 65 million people, only one family gets to determine who will be king or queen and who will be the head of state. That seems to me to be a remarkable situation. And I, like Muir, would rail against that. But I have to confess to you, the thing that really amazes me is the fact that such uh, what I regard as a common sense, matter of fact proposition that the head of state ought to be elected is regarded as really some extremist outlandish proposition that is beyond the pale of modern politics. And anyone who advocates it will be instantly dismissed, possibly accused of sedition. I don't, I don't, I don't know. But it, it is remarkable. And I can only hope that the next time there is a secession to the throne, that we do take the opportunity to review, if not the dissolution of the monarchy, at least a reconsideration of its place in our modern constitution and its role. Because the monarchy, unelected people as a matter of principle, should not be able to exercise political power over, every, over the other people if we believe we live in a democratic society. But here's the final thing that I think Muir would be intrigued about, and that is our campaign for Scottish independence that's taken place over the last few years. Now, people will ask, you know, would Muir have voted yes if he had been alive in 2014? I don't know. But what I do know, and we have records of this, was that while he was in France with Payne in tow, they were arguing and developing a plan and petitioning the French government to support the creation of three separate republics in the British Isles, one in Ireland, one in Scotland, and one in England. And those radicals in the end of the 18th century, they didn't have any problem at all about understanding that the cause of democratic reform and progress in one country would assist those efforts in another. And in fact, that the best thing they could do was to link arms, to link organizations, and to build a radical movement for political reform, which might result in separate republics, but which is essentially the same movement over that part of the world, in, in other words, the British Isles. And I do think one of the things we need to consider is that we need to locate the campaign for Scottish self-government in that context of the tradition of political reform within these islands. And we need to explain to people who don't live in Scotland that we advocate self-government for our country not just because it is good in principle that the people who live here should be the ones who control it, but because we believe also it will be a catalyst for political reform elsewhere in the United Kingdom. That is why I believe in Scottish independence, and I believe that's probably why Thomas Muir would have believed in it too. Now I want to turn to the 2014 referendum. I'll just have a little... Drink. A lot has been written about uh, what happened in the referendum campaign of 2012-2014. I just want to take a minute to recap because for me, it was without doubt the most uh, remarkable political campaign that I've ever been involved in and I've been involved in a few. It was a campaign that reached people literally that other campaigns have never reached. It achieved a level of motivation, a level of discussion, a level of action 
that has never been seen before. It was a very positive campaign. We conducted that campaign always accentuating the positive, always regarding problems as something that could be overcome and trying to find solutions to them, not regarding them as barriers. Always saying we didn't have opponents, we only had people we had yet to convince. But most particularly, we created a political alliance during that campaign of people who believed in independence as a matter of principle, together with people who believed in independence as a, as a way of changing the world. And that political amalgam was a, a, a tremendous coming together, a fusion, if you like, of the two radical traditions of Scotland, the campaign for national economy and the campaign for social justice, which is a much more contemporary one. But they fused together in that 2012 to 2014 referendum campaign and became almost a new political hybrid. Because when people asked, should Scotland be an independent country? It provoked many other questions. People said, well, what sort of country? For whose benefit? Who wins? Who loses? What would it look like? And invariably, people found themselves answering back, well, we want a Scotland that is different from the one in which we live today, one that is fairer, more tolerant, more equal, more outward looking than the country in which we're living today. And so those people who long aspired for social and economic change came to view independence as a means to get it. And that is why people's imagination caught fire in 2013 and 2014. That is why a million conversations all over this land created the situation they did, where 45% of our fellow countrymen and women voted to secede from the fifth most powerful country on the planet. And it didn't start out that way. What happened, because the 45%, what happened is that that rose from 25% at the beginning of the campaign. Put it another way, three quarters of a million people voted for independence in September 2014 who did not agree with it when the campaign started. And that is a remarkable turnaround and a remarkable vindication of political activity. But we didn't win. And I think we have spent the three years since trying to understand what we do next. Because, as Jamie also alluded to, you might think that if you didn't win a campaign like that, after having put so much effort into it, it would be like bursting a balloon, that it would just dissipate and go away. But in fact, the losing of the referendum seemed to be a fillip, seemed to be a boost to people who wanted radical change, and the momentum seemed to carry on into 2015. Now, I know there will be people who will say, who will be concerned that what has happened this year in 2017 is somehow a reversal of what that momentum was, and they will be anxiously wondering, what do we do next? So I want to spend the next few minutes looking at what happened in this year's general election. Now, at 10 o'clock on the 8th of June, I, was, uh, I just arrived at the Meadowbank Sports Centre where they were counting the votes for the Edinburgh constituencies, and it was just as the uh, exit poll came out on the BBC, which predicted that... Contrary to all expectations, Theresa May's Conservative government had just snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. And it, uh, in fact, what started as a majority Conservative government was no longer. We were looking at a hung parliament in the UK and that the SNP was looking at losing a third or more of its seats in Scotland. And that was the exit poll and nobody believed it at 10 o'clock. And I spent the next 90 minutes doing TV and radio interviews explaining how if the poll were true, uh, this would be a major defeat for the Tories, and in fact, it would be a major victory for the SNP because we had won in Scotland as the Tories had lost in the UK. Both of us knowing, the interviewee and the interviewer, that the exit poll probably was rubbish, but we had time to fill before the real results came in. But as it turned out, contrary to expectations, the exit poll was remarkably accurate. And as we was first results came in and the second wave came in, it began to look like this was indeed what was going to happen. And the situation in Scotland was certainly on the one hand that uh, the SNP did win uh, 30, uh, 36 seats. It won a, a majority, 60% of all of the seats that it contested. The only party in the UK to win a majority of seats that it contested. Um, it also won 37% uh, of the vote, more than any other party. And it won more votes than any other party. So 
what's to worry about? Of course, it was a, of course it was a victory. It was, in truth, the second best ever Westminster election campaign for the SNP. And had it not been for the electoral tsunami of 2015, people would have said, this is a, a, a truly remarkable result. But it didn't feel like that to me, and I doubt it felt like that to many of the people who might support the things that I believe in in this hall. Because there's another way of looking at it, and that is that in the space of just two years, the SNP's vote came down from 49% to 37%. A massive loss of votes in a very short period of time. In fact, 480,000 people who had voted for the SNP in 2015 declined to do so in 2017. More worryingly, in 2015, the SNP had more than 50% of the votes in 35 constituencies in Scotland. Today, it has 50% of the votes in not one constituency in Scotland. And many of the seats that it does hold can truly be regarded as marginal. So if anybody thinks this is anything other than a major wake-up call for the SNP or indeed anyone in the wider independence movement, then they need to go and think again, because a wake-up call it is. And we need to understand what happened that led to those results. Now, in the one hand, the research shows that the, the biggest group of those 480,000 people simply stayed at home. They didn't vote for anyone, about 70% of them, according to the surveys. But amongst the rest, there were changes in political allegiance. And I want to look at four reasons why they happened. The first was the Conservative campaign to do with the second independence referendum. Now, let's be clear, the objective of that campaign was not to persuade people who support independence to stop supporting it and vote Tory. It wasn't that at all. The objective of the campaign was to position the Conservative Party as the political leadership of the Unionist majority in Scotland. It was to try and galvanize support within people who already believed in the Union. For that reason, they changed the name and started calling themselves the Scottish Unionist Party. They tried this faux separation from their London leadership. And they talked incessantly about nothing else than the Union and the Second Independence Referendum. Even when people like me weren't talking about it, you could be sure that Ruth Davidson would be. So what they were trying to do in that was to level a very clear accusation. The conservative accusation was that we were the anti-democrats. We were the ones who did not respect the view of the Scottish people because they had voted just in 2014 to remain part of the union and we were ignoring that, disrespecting it, and they, the Conservative Party, they were the voice of the people. They were the new friends of the people. That was what they were trying to say. Now, of course, it's more complicated than that. We know that the vote, the vote happened in 2014. We know that we lost. I think everyone, most people will, will accept that we lost. But the argument was that if circumstances were to change to such an extent that they invalidated the options that were presented to people in 2014, then it would be legitimate to have that vote again. In much the same way, if you get back from the shop and you find when you open the box that the thing inside is not what was described on the outside, you've got the right to go and get your money back or get the thing changed. People would have a right to get their vote back if the terms of 2014 were changed by the people who had won. That was the argument. And in fact, that wasn't just a theoretical argument. In the Scottish National Party manifesto for the Scottish general election of May 2016, this was written down and exemplified. And it said, if, for example, Scotland is taken out of the European Union against its will, then that might occasion the need for a second referendum because people had voted in 2014 to stay in the UK, partly because they believed that was a way of staying in the European Union. That was the argument. Now, even I have to admit, that's a pretty complex and nuanced argument. And it's not really that good of a, 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 a confrontation against somebody simply saying, you have had your referendum, why do you need another one? So we got drawn in to a discussion, not about the benefits of independence, but about the technicalities of the vote. 
we got drawn into talking about process rather than principle, which is exactly what the conservatives wanted. Because all of their polling showed that actually there, there were more people concerned about an independence referendum than were concerned about independence. And that's why you never heard the Tories slag off independence. They never said, oh, we're against independence, it's a bad idea. They talked always about the second in the referendum. And they did a second thing, which was a second factor in the election campaign. They tried to abstract the notion of the referendum and make it a dry constitutional academic debate and then juxtapose it with what they would regard as the real business of government, the day job, as if people who argued for independence somehow were incapable, therefore, because of that, of running schools, hospitals, police services, or whatever. And we gave ground in that, and we never, ever should. Because Thomas Muir knew that in order to advance political reform, you had to root the political and constitutionals, constitutional changes you were arguing for in the material condition of the people that were affected by them. So you had to argue that the reason why we wanted political reform was to make life better for people. The two things should never be divorced. And I believe that one of the things that we need to do is that we need to get back to a situation of arguing, yes, about the achievements of the devolved Scottish government, and they are legion, but always pointing out that those things have been achieved in a situation where the Scottish government essentially operates within financial and legislative constraints which are not of its making, and it has, in real terms, got one hand tied behind its back. So as well as offering up something to praise or to be proud about in terms of a government achievement, I think we also need to say, and if we had the powers of an independent country, this is what we could do in addition to that. You need to show people how we can go further. The question of the second independence referendum, of course, was in itself taken out of our hands by uh, the election on June the 8th, because the reason, the whole connection with, um, with, with the debate on Brexit was was about how we might activate that mandate that we got in 2016, which said we could have a second referendum in second terms, uh, in uncertain terms. And of course, at the beginning of this year, at the beginning of 2017, well, actually, before I get to that, it's, it's worth noting that as soon as Brexit happened, as soon as that vote happened, and it played out almost exactly as the scenario was envisaged in the manifesto, as soon as you had a situation where people in Scotland voted by 62% to remain in the EU, but people in the rest of the UK voted to leave, then you had a situation where what was described in the manifesto was actually coming to pass. And you had the opportunity to activate that albeit conditional mandate that had been received. But it's interesting to note that the reaction of the Scottish government wasn't to say, right, we're running for a second referendum now because of this. Actually, they tried to square the circle. They tried to respect both the decision of 2014 in the Scottish referendum and 2016 in the Brexit referendum. And they came up with a series of quite detailed proposals which were published in December last year called Scotland's, uh, a framework document for Scotland's place in Europe, which suggested a way in which Scotland could have a different relationship with the European Union than the rest of the United Kingdom, while still remaining part of the United Kingdom. Now this was produced by an SNP government that believes in independence and believes in the European Union, and it advocated neither of those things. It was truly a remarkable act of compromise. And what happened next was the reaction to that from the British government, which was at best dismissive and disrespectful, and basically they refused to negotiate on that document. So I think, to be honest, by the time we get to March of this year, I don't think Nicola Sturgeon had any option left but to say, well, we don't know what Brexit means, but we do know that every conceivable option within a range of options that are on the table are going to be prejudicial to Scotland's economic interest and they are going to be contrary to Scottish public opinion. So therefore, we can see no other scenario but that there has to be a new referendum on Scottish independence and we need to start setting the timetable. That was the position in March. That was what Ruth Davidson fought the campaign upon. And the irony is this, that that position changed after the general election on June the 8th. But the reason why it changed was in itself because of the result of that election. You no longer had a majority, you no longer have a majority 
Tory government, you can no longer argue, I certainly can't argue, that the range of potential options, and again, we don't know what Brexit will look like, but the range of potential options exclude any possibility of us getting a deal that might be satisfactory in the short term, that might have different relationships for Scotland, that might have different powers for the Scottish government, that might go some way towards Scottish public opinion. I really don't know. But the fact is now, because we don't know, we do have to wait and see what the outcome of Brexit is before we can actually activate that mandate that we have from the 2016 election campaign. And the irony is this, that the Scottish Conservatives will claim this as a victory, the fact that we have pressed the pause button on a second referendum. But the reality is the reason why that has happened is not because the, the Conservatives won seats in Scotland, but it's because they lost seats in the rest of the United Kingdom and no longer have a majority in Parliament. The third factor that was at play on June the 8th was Brexit itself, which I say that, and then I think about the campaign, and it's really it's quite remarkable. An election that was called ostensibly because of Brexit actually never mentioned it during the campaign itself. But it, that, that didn't really matter because for the last two years we have talked about precious little else, and clearly it had made people had formed opinions about it. Now it's fair to say I think that the SNP was probably the most uh, unequivocal pro-EU party, pro-Remain party in the run-up to the Brexit debate. But of course, there were many supporters, some members of the SNP, uh, who disagreed with that, who do not see the European so Union as something they want to be part of and want to support. And I believe that some of those people did not want to vote SNP on June the 8th because they did not want that vote to be taken as a mandate to challenge the Brexit decision that had been taken by the UK the, the year before, because they, broadly speaking, agreed with that. They didn't vote for anyone else, by and large, but they simply stayed at home rather than have their vote misinterpreted. And I think, of course, the way in which the party presented the arguments for having a second independence referendum as being inherently linked to the outcome of Brexit conflated these two things in, in the public mind in a way in which they didn't need to be conflated. Now, there are good reasons for not liking the European Union and there are bad reasons for not liking the European Union. Good reasons might include the common fisheries policy, the restraints on national governments being able to borrow and invest in their own economy and a, a lack of democratic accountability of the institutions to ordinary people. Bad reasons would be xenophobia and a general isolationist view and lack of will to cooperate with others. Myself, I am, I am very pro-European, I'm pro-EU, my position was remain and reform. I don't see it as the be-all and end-all, I don't see it as a perfect institution, but I see it as better than not having it. And if it wasn't there in the first place, I think we would by now wish to create it. And that's because I believe that, you know, capitalist corporations that now control the global economy, it is better, I think, if national governments combine together to try and locate those corporations within a regulatory framework which limits their ability to exploit their workforce, to rip off their customers, or indeed to harm the environment in which they are operating. Better to have that regulation than not to have it and to allow unfettered markets that allow corporations to do what they want. But that's a difficult and tricky argument to try and get across to people, and that reform in Remain point of view, frankly, wasn't even, didn't even get airtime during the Brexit debate and the, uh, the process leading up to the vote in June uh, 2016. But that, that would be my position. But I think the main position that we should adopt now, and I say this in terms of the wider movement that supports Scottish independence, because we, always, we always need to be concerned. The, the truth is now, I think, we are leaving the EU and the debate about, you know, well, if Scotland became independent, it could just remain in the EU because it already was, or we could take, some people remember the argument, we could take over the membership card if the rest of the UK wants to leave and we want to stay. I think those are all gone now, to be honest. I think we're, we're leaving the EU and the reality is that if an independent Scotland at some point in the future wanted to rejoin the EU, uh, it would have to negotiate its way in. And therefore, I think what we need to do now is we need to begin to develop a vision of what type of European Union we would like to be part of. We need to develop an agenda for change with other progressive parties across the European continent of how those institutions should change. And if and when we get the opportunity to do so, and I'll come to this in a moment, 
then a, an independent Scottish government should negotiate the best possible deal for Scotland within the EU, which may include full membership or which may not. It may be some hybrid solution. I, I wouldn't preempt the outcome, but it should negotiate from the point of view is, of what is best for the people that live here. And when it's got the best deal it can, then it should put that to another referendum, a plebiscite of the people who live in Scotland, so that they can decide on their relationship as an independent country with the rest of the European continent. Because independence is about having the right to make your own decisions, whether that be what type of health service you want to have, or whether that be the relationship you have with other countries. And I think if we were to develop an argument in that way, then we can decouple the arguments for self-government from the arguments for the European Union, and we can allow people to support one without having to support the other, which is an important point we need to get to on our route to a majority. So we have the second referendum, we have the, the day job, and we have Brexit, and the fourth, the fourth factor that was at play in the general, general election was what you might call the Corbyn factor. And we might as well spend a couple of minutes discussing it. Now, Jeremy Corbyn, for all you can say about him, has, you know, he has taken the Labour Party in a different direction. And if you cast your mind back to the run-up to the 2015 general election, and indeed during the referendum campaign itself, the argument of me and people like me who were standing for the SNP, or indeed for the Green Party or other pro-independence parties, was that actually... Labour had sold, sold the jerseys. We called them red Tories, not just because they associated them better together with the Conservatives throughout the referendum campaign, but because they supported Trident. They supported more or less the Conservative government's or the coalition government's uh, austerity plans. They supported foreign interventions that we did not. So we gave them uh, this moniker, and it, and it resonated, and it stuck, in large part because it was true. But say what you want about Jeremy Corbyn, you can call him many things, but the moniker Red Tory doesn't really stick. And that meant that as he was being vilified by the Tory press for taking Labour in a certain direction, he gained a lot of sympathy. He gained sympathy from people who believe in the things that I believe in. And I know people. I mean, this had more of an effect in, in England, where he began to actually talk about people power and political engagement, political involvement, Resonating many of the themes, I think, that were there in the independence campaign of 2014. Now, it had a bigger effect in England than here, but Scotland was not immune. And I know of people in my constituency who have come to me and they said, Tommy, we voted yes in 2014. We voted for you in 2015, but we felt we had to support Jeremy Corbyn because of what he's saying, because, you know, he's this radical. And Corbyn caught the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times. He really did and a very adept social media campaign, and again, borrowed some tricks from the Yes campaign, was very effective at promoting this. And I don't think our response to that was adequate. And I'll go on in a minute about what that response should be, but that is undoubtedly a fact that Jeremy Corbyn uh, had an effect. Now, there are many ironies that result from what happened. The, the first and obvious one is that um, the Scottish Labour leadership has spent the last two years trying to undermine Jeremy Corbyn, and you couldn't get two political institutions that are further apart than the opposition office in, in, uh, in, in, in Westminster and the headquarters of the Scottish Labour Party. But that seems to have dissipated now. I mean, I witnessed Ian Murray lead the standing ovation for Jeremy Corbyn when, um, when he came into the House of Commons after the election. So they're all Corbynites now, it would seem, or at least until, <laughs> at least until something happens. But, but another great irony is, of course, that when people did that and went out and voted Labour rather than SNP in seats which were marginal between the two, in some cases what they succeeded in doing was actually getting rid of left-wing SNP MPs like George Carafin or Anne McLaughlin, who were quite well disposed to Jeremy Corbyn, and replacing them with right-wing Labour MPs who very much are not and who will still got problems for them in the future. And I don't know how that's going to play out. But the biggest irony of all is this, that because, because the Labour vote churned so much in this election, and they undoubtedly lost votes to the Conservatives 
on what you might call their older right-wing vote, who were seduced by these arguments about the defending the union is more important than social and economic change, and perhaps they didn't really like Jeremy Corbyn anyway, and they went on Facebook so they couldn't get an alternative point of view. They lost votes in that direction, but they gained votes from people who would be, regard themselves as part of the, the, the Yes movement, uh, maybe voted SNP, maybe voted Green, maybe voted some, maybe didn't vote, but, but now they came in and they voted uh, for Jeremy Corbyn. Because of that, because of that change, we now have a weird situation where actually the cohort of Labour voters in Scotland is now probably more well disposed to the concept of political independence for Scotland than it has ever been, and is therefore more out of step with its leadership in Scotland than it has ever been. Now, an interesting thing to observe will be how the Scottish Labour leadership respond to that. But if they begin to allow discussion about the Constitution within the ranks of the Labour Party, if people who support independence in the Labour Party, and there are quite a few, are allowed to organise and promote their ideas, then I think we get into quite a, an interesting new situation. And I think the wider Yes movement should keep a canny eye on that and be very supportive of those developments if it takes place. If that doesn't happen, then I think many of those people will quickly be disillusioned with where they placed their votes and come back. So what should the response, I ask this question to myself, not to you, what should our response to, to Corbyn's Labour Party be if, if, you're, if you were in my position? Well, I think the first thing to say is that um, we should work together where we can. There is no point in manufacturing political disagreement for the sake of it. And if in the House of Commons at Westminster the opportunity presents for Labour and the SNP and the other opposition parties to come together and maybe drag a couple of disaffected Tories with us and defeat the government in any particular policy, we should seize that opportunity. So we need to be prepared to do that and to work very effectively together. I think at local level too there is no reason why Labour councillors and SNP councillors cannot work together. It's interesting that here in this city, that despite the fact it took sort of several months of posturing and politicking because of other elections getting in the way, when the SNP and Labour groups did decide to form a coalition, it was actually a very simple process to put together a program for what they would do because to a very great extent their manifestos overlapped and they agreed on the political objectives. So where we can, we should probably be working with the Labour Party. I see no reason to be sectarian about this. But the second thing I think we need to do is we need to explain, particularly to those young voters who voted for Corbyn for the first time, the limitations of Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party, and they are legion. The first thing to say is that Corbyn is not a fan of constitutional or electoral reform, and the basic constitutional setup in this country is not going to change either in Scotland or in England if, we, uh, if, we, if, if he becomes Prime Minister and is a position to run the country. But the second thing to say is actually Jeremy Corbyn, despite his personal beliefs on the matter, has been unable to get his party to a position where they might ask for a review, never mind stepping back from our expanding nuclear weapons program. Also in terms of the welfare state, the Labour manifesto was far less radical in reversing the cuts to welfare and investing in public services than that was contained in the SNP manifesto. It really was. So in fact, what I'm saying to you is that Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party isn't half as radical as it thinks it is. But the other big argument against Jeremy Corbyn, I'm afraid, is that despite the fact that the Tory government was in chaos and imploding in the run-up to the election, despite the fact that they had this massive ferment across the country of support with new layers of people voting for the very first time, it would seem, and despite the fact of enormous goodwill from people who might have voted for the Liberal Democrats or indeed for the SNP or for Greens or other parties, deciding to give Corbyn their vote, to lend it to him this time, in spite of all of that, he did not win. He did not win the UK general election. He didn't even come close to winning the UK general election. The gulf between the Labour Party and the Tory Party is still remarkable. So unless we genuinely believe that Jeremy Corbyn is going to be able to go further and win conservative seats in England, then his route to government doesn't look very promising. And I say this knowing that at the minute Jeremy Corbyn is on his way back from Stornoway in the Western Isles where he's doing this mini Scottish tour that's being broadcast on the, on the media. 
And I do find this remarkable, actually, that this is the labor strategy, because presumably what they think is available here is some sort of low-hanging political fruit in these SNP labor marginals where they can go in and win seats of the SNP. But that is not the route to a Jeremy Corbyn government. It doesn't really matter if Labour took every seat off the SNP. Jeremy Corbyn still wouldn't have enough seats to become Prime Minister. The only way he can become Prime Minister is if the Labour Party recovers in England and begins winning seats off the Tories in all those parts of that country where they have lost them. That is the truth of the matter. So if anybody is pinning their hopes on Jeremy Corbyn, I think they're going to, they're going to be disappointed. And the other thing I think that we need to do in our response is always to accentuate our USP, our unique selling point. And that is the fact that we believe that this should be a self-governing country and we sh should be allowed to take a decision on becoming an independent country. And that, you know, we, we spent some of the last election saying, oh, this isn't about independence and it got confusing and then it was a triple lock and then it was about independence. And, you know, the, 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 shall I just say the message was unclear for large parts of the election campaign, which might have been a contributory factor in the result. But the truth is, if you're voting for the Scottish National Party, it's always going to be an expression of aspiration, an expression that you would like to support the idea of Scotland being its own independent country. There's no way away from that. No matter what election, even if it's an election for the for community council and somebody standing as the SNP candidate and you decide to vote for him, that's part of the package. That is what we are, and we should never run away from it. Sometimes that vote will deliver a mandate that can be executed to achieve change, and some circumstances it will not deliver a mandate because we will not be able to do anything at that particular point in time. But it will always be an expression of support for the idea. And here, this brings me to a, a key question. Some people will say that what happened on June the 8th, with support for the SNP slipping, with the Greens not standing and therefore not getting you know, much support neither, and with support for the Tories and what, and, and what, what apparently was a, a unionist Labour Party rising, they might surmise, oh, well, this is now a reversal for the independence campaign. This is a reversal for those who believe in self-government. Well, actually, it isn't. Because the polls, when you ask people, do they support Scottish independence? That remains relatively consistent at sort of low 42 to 46 percent all of the time over the last two years. The fact of the matter is that the principal party that advocates independence is now polling considerably lower than the number of people who say they support the idea. And that is the thing that people in my party, I think, need to address. So, what do we do about this going forward? Well, before I get to that, I want to... Well, I think one of the things we had to do, as I said earlier, is I think we need to locate the campaign for Scottish self-government within the wider context of political reform in the British Isles. And that means we need to explain to people, not in Scotland, particularly we need to explain to people who would regard themselves as progressive or radical in England and in Wales and in Ireland, why what we are arguing for here would benefit all of the people that live in this part of the world. But before we do that, we need to confront two things, I think, which are suggested by these very same people. People who would regard themselves as uh, left-leaning, as, uh, you know, as liberal, as socialist, or, or whatever. People who, many of whom, write for The Guardian. There are two things that we need to confront. The first is this notion of solidarity, because I don't know how often you've heard this from people from a labor or union background. But they say, oh, the working class in Glasgow and in Edinburgh have more in common with the working class in Liverpool and Manchester than they do with the uh, state owners and the ruling class in, 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 in Scotland. So, so th they shouldn't be supporting a, an independent Scotland because of that. Now, in one sense, that's a truism. Yes, of course, people who have nothing uh, but their labor to sell have got more in common with each other, no matter where they live, uh, than people who own and control the wealth in our society. But the working class of Glasgow and Edinburgh have got more in common with the working class of Marseille, of Milan, of Detroit, of Michigan, you get the idea, than they have with the people who rule their own country as well. And if you say that this communality of interest across the border is in itself a justification 
for maintaining the union of the United Kingdom, then what in fact you are saying is that that is the optimum political arrangement for advancing class interests within this part of the world. And my contention is that if that was ever true, it certainly isn't true anymore. In fact, I would argue that a potentially progressive reformist majority in Scotland is being held back by the fact that it is being attached to a much bigger conservative uh, majority in a larger country. And that if it were to disengage from that political arrangement, it could not only move forward and change things here and make things better, but it could be a catalyst for the rest of the country to see what is possible. Because there are many people in the, you know, and throughout all of England, you know, I'm thinking particularly in the, in, the, in the southeast, many, many people who, who look at what's happening in Scotland with some envy. They see the fact that our kids don't pay university fees. They see the fact we don't pay prescriptions, that we, you know, a lot of things appear to be better here, that care for the elderly or whatever, than, than what they are experiencing. They see that our health service has many problems, but it's not under the same intense constraint and pressure that the health services in many parts of England. And they look at that with a degree of envy. And then the Daily Mail tells them, oh, well, the only reason they're getting that is because you're subsidizing them through your taxes. You're paying for it. Now, that's a lie. But the way to prove it's a lie is through having Scotland become an independent country and demonstrating that we can do these things simply by making political choices to do them and organizing our society in that way. And that would be a tremendously powerful message for people who aspire to that type of change in England as well. So we need to, contact, uh, con uh, we need to um, fight this, uh, this notion that solidarity somehow means that you cannot be expressed with Scotland becoming an independent country. In fact, we could probably, as a country, as a people, develop much more solidarity with the rest of the world where we free agents and able to act alone with our independent government. The second thing I think we need to discuss with some people on the English left, not all, but some people on the English left, is, is, what, is the N-word, okay? Because you would have seen this. I see it in the, in, in, in the Guardian from time to time. Some people writing, and they, they basically say that the, the campaign for independence, for Scottish independence, is a, first of all, it's a nationalist campaign, and secondly, nationalism is inherently divisive and negative and a bad thing. Now, neither of those things are true, and we need to say so quite loudly. The first thing to say is that the Yes campaign, the SNP today, is made up of many different types of people, who, many of whom have different ideologies. There are socialists, social democrats, liberals, greens, people who just call themselves democrats, and nationalists. Of course there are. But it has never just been about one thing. It has been about a range of different political ideologies coming together, bound together by an arc that says the ultimate goal is that people should be allowed to decide these things in this country for themselves. And that is the overarching arc which brings us together, but we have many different perspectives on how that should be. I myself, I said before, I am not a nationalist. If you have to give me a, a label, call me a Republican Social Democrat. But I am happy to work with people who call themselves nationalists because here's the thing. As soon as you talk to any contemporary Scottish nationalist, assuming that we mean by nationalism that there is a national interest which transcends other interests and has to be advocated and defended. But as soon as you talk to anybody who calls himself a Scottish nationalist, you very quickly realize that what they are concerned about is not their wee bit hill and glen, but it's about the injustice and the inequality that is visited daily upon the people and the communities in which they live. So actually, the national interest becomes the public interest. And by national, we mean the people who live in the nation. And that is a wholly progressive and inclusive concept. And we have never, in the SNP or in the Yes movement or anybody else who supports independence, we have never done anything other than say, it does not matter where you come from. What matters is that you're here and we are going forward together. So for people who ought to know better, to try and associate our movement with the alt-right in America or the ethnic cleansers of Eastern Europe and to suggest there is some 
continuum here because they're going to label all of these things nationalist is not only wrong, it is intellectually dishonest and it is offensive. So, having confronted those things, I think we need to look to the, the future. What would the timetable be? We know the, we know the referendum's on pause, so what's going to happen next? And I sense a lot of people as I go around the country talking about this, they feel a sense of concern, of, of unease, not sure what happens next, are we losing ground, you know, what, how do we keep this thing going? Well, the truth of the matter is this, I think, that we have said that we need to see what happens with Brexit before we can decide whether or not that activates the mandate which we have in place from the 2016 general election to have another independence referendum conditional upon what happens in Brexit. So we need to see what happens. The truth is we won't know what happens until the late 2018, maybe even till 2019. And the truth also is that you can't have a referendum the next day. We would have to schedule a campaign period and a build up to it. So I can't see in that scenario any way practically where there could be a Scottish referendum before 2020. Oh, by the way, I should have said, there's a caveat to all of what comes next. And that is, this is what it looks now. It might be different next week. <laughs> okay? Because this last two years have been so politically turbulent. Things have happened so quickly and unexpectedly that, to be honest, we may have to react quickly, and I don't know. But, but from this pulpit tonight, just thinking ahead, the way I see it is that if we were to go and continue to link a Scottish referendum with the outcome of Brexit, I don't think that could even be organized before 2020. Now, here's the thing. By 2020, we will be on a countdown to the 2021 Scottish general election. So we have a choice, or at least a choice presents itself. Either we can try and activate another referendum on the question of Scottish independence on the heavily nuanced proposition that's conditional on the outcome of Brexit, and it is basically revisiting the question of 2014 to say that the options have changed, therefore we need to look at them again. Or we can go forward to the 2021 election and try and win a fresh mandate, which is unconditional on anything, and simply says, this is not a revote of 2014, this is a new vote on a new proposition because the world has changed and the opportunities for Scotland that flow from that change are also different than what they were before. And I believe that we can build a majority behind that second approach. But I know, and there will be people here and we will have questions in a minute, I know there will be people who are concerned about that. They will say, well, we could lose all this. You know, we might not win in 20, 2011. The Tories could win, who knows, right? The whole thing might just be dead. Well, it might be, it might be, of course. But I say to you, have courage in your conviction. Because the truth is this, if we can't win the general election, and by we now I mean a range of pro-independence parties, if we cannot win a majority in the 2021 Scottish general election under a system of proportional, relevant, of proportional representation, which more or less allocates seats according to the votes cast, then we will not be able to win a Scottish referendum the year before anyway, especially if it is conditioned upon a set of conditions and outcomes that people really aren't sure about. So therefore, I think the strategy now is to go and have a plan that comes back from 2021 and looks to secure a majority so that we go forward to have another referendum, not a second referendum, a completely new referendum with a new set of circumstances simply because the world has changed and the passage of time has taken place and it is legitimate to ask the question again because so many people want to do so. And I believe that is the strategy that we should take. I should stress, I'm not here as a party spokesperson. I'm here trying to throw out some ideas for discussion. And here's the other thing that we need to do then. Working back from 2021, we need to have a strategy to win. And that means we need to put together a prospectus for self-government in this country which answers some of the questions that were left unanswered in 2014, which takes account of changed circumstances, particularly Brexit and the change in the constitutional position of the United Kingdom, and it seeks to build a majority political alliance
behind it on the basis that self-government will make things better for people. I think we can do that, and I think there are four themes that we should accentuate. The first of them is we should talk about a prosperous Scotland. We will not get a majority of our fellow citizens to vote for independence if they believe it will lead to their impoverishment. And there is no, idea, no reason why it should and we should say so. The figures that were uh, produced yesterday and, and wide, were widely reported that the uh, Scottish deficit is falling. I suppose some people might be pleased to know that. The truth is there's no such thing as a Scottish deficit because there's no such thing as a separate national Scottish economy. So we can't actually measure a Scottish deficit. What we have is a measure of the performance of a regional economy within the, a much bigger state called the United Kingdom. And to get to those figures, a whole lot of assumptions are made and estimates are made which simply would not apply if you were trying to do a balance sheet for an independent country. But most of all, <laughs> no allowance is made for the fact that an independent Scottish government might of itself choose to do things differently, which would then lead to a situation where we, of course we can afford the level of public provision that we want. And I would actually say that the JERS figures, I'm sure most in this audience know the acronym, the JERS figures are not a reason to not consider alternative ways of running the Scottish comedy, uh, the co uh, co economy. They're actually an indictment of the current situation of Scotland being a regional economy within the United Kingdom. So if anything, it's because of that apparent deficit at the minute that we should be seeking to take control of the main economic levers that any independent government would expect to have so that we can begin to build our economy so that we can increase productivity and invest dramatically in our renewable energy resources and in our infrastructure. And if we do that, I believe we could be not just a successful economy, but we could see levels of growth which far outperform the rest of the United Kingdom because as a peripheral economy, we have effectively been held back for quite some time. The second theme would be to have a democratic Scotland. I realize I may be, am I going, I'm probably going on far too long here, but um, I think we need to have a democratic Scotland. And it strikes me as really quite amazing that it's almost a generation since the last local government reform in Scotland. And we have a system of 32 local councils in Scotland, which was essentially the boundaries were decided by Michael Forsyth, now Lord Forsyth. And the funding system in which they're based, with a few changes along the way, is essentially the same as devised by Michael Heseltine, now Lord Heseltine. Now, I think as a country we should aspire to do rather better than a system that we have been bequeathed from two Tory grandees. And I believe that we can do a lot better. Leslie Riddick, last year at the same time, outlined quite a few plans for the reform of local government. And I would associate with myself with all the sentiments that Leslie said. I don't want to repeat them. But I want to stress one thing. And that is that we need to get away from the mindset that says that if you're trying to rearrange how things are governed, then you also have to rearrange the management of every service. You know, Edinburgh could have 12 local councils operating within the city. Doesn't mean we have to have 12 refuse departments. Far from it. It just means that people in local areas can decide what their priorities are. And if they want, they can add a precept onto the local tax, which allows them to have a better level of service or to do something that doesn't happen elsewhere. And I believe that's the way we need to be thinking and engaging people in that debate. Now, that's probably going to take, that's probably after we become an independent country, in truth. But um, the other thing that we should be doing in terms of a democratic country, and I, I, I'm not sure if there are people in this room who are already engaged in this, but I think there is a lot of work to do in beginning to develop a new constitution for an independent Scotland, which will set out the rules and obligations and expectations, not just of citizens, but of different layers of government and show how they connect together. And I don't, I think that is a debate that would continue after we decide to become an independent country and we should be ratifying a constitution at some stage after a vote on the principle of becoming independent. But I think much of the thinking ought to start now. Thirdly, I think we need to be a caring Scotland. I think one of the best things about the Scottish government is that it has defended the principle of universalism 
in public service provision. The old adage that, you know, to everybody according to their needs and from everybody according to their abilities. It has defended that against many critics who go on about rich pensioners shouldn't be getting bus passes and all the rest of it. And it's done that because it's the right way to organize the services in a community. And because if you don't do that, and you begin to say, oh, only the really needy people should be getting this, then you residualize the service, and you lose public support for the service, and you lose public support for people paying taxes to fund the service. So I believe we need to argue about this, and as we go forward building on the new Scottish social security system, we need also to make plans for how we would take over the remaining functions of social security, most of which are being retained by Westminster, and how in an independent country we would devise a taxation system that was fair, that was equitable, and that you weren't able to cheat. So those are challenges for building a caring Scotland in our new prospectus. And finally, we need to talk about an open Scotland. And that means this country needs to be seen as a beacon that welcomes people from across the world. We have an immigration problem in Scotland. We don't have enough of it. And we need policies that will encourage people to come and relocate here. We need a drive to try and educate and involve the people who are already here in welcoming and integrating those who come. And we need to realize that the Scotland of the future ought to be a multinational, multi-ethnic, diverse country that is welcoming to the rest of the world. And we can do that as a beacon, I think, against others who put forward a contrary view. And that should be part of our new prospectus for Scotland as well. And I think if we begin to build in those themes and work out a new prospectus and spend the next year developing it, and then three years arguing for it, I believe we will be able to take the next step. Because I believe what happened in September the 18th, 2014, was not the high watermark of the campaign for self-government. That was but the new base camp from which we go forward in the future. Now, we have some distance yet to travel. And I, want to find, I want to end by this by going back to Thomas Muir and considering how we should do it. I speak not for the SNP, but I speak as an SNP politician. But I know that the SNP can only take this campaign so far. It will take more than the SNP for this country to become an independent country. And I think most of us in the party recognize that. So what is important is that we begin to create a movement and a momentum that involves ordinary people who don't want to be associated with a political party, but who may indeed be members of other political parties or none, who come together for a common objective. And I go back and finishing to Thomas Muir, who when he and William Skirving set up the Friends of the People in this city in 1792, they took the name of a similar organization that had already been established in London. But there was one crucial difference. In London, you had to pay three guineas subscription to join, and it was effectively a closed secret society. Muir insisted that the Friends of the People in Edinburgh should be open to all and that everyone should be able to come to their meetings, knowing full well that there would be government spies amongst the audience. But he felt it was important that we should always advocate these things in public. We should always reach out beyond the people who already believe to those who are thinking about it and welcome them in to the cause in the future. That's the task that lies ahead of us. I believe that we are up to it and I believe in a few short years, we will be facing the prospect of this country becoming the newest self-governing nation in the world.